Um, so I'm here to talk about the five phases of DevOps and what that kind of means. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a DevOps engineer at GoGo. I've been there for about five years, so I've seen the organization go through a lot of change, a lot of shift, uh, going from a very automation, uh, very non-automation, non-DevOps culture to now a DevOps culture. So this kind of talk is to kind of describe the changes an organization kind of goes through to kind of see that happen. So why am I here? Why am I in front of you all here today, aside from being in front of the, one of the best conferences in the city, uh, DevOps Days? It's because this is, uh, I want to talk about the five phases of DevOps. So when you're making a shift to a DevOps culture, and note that I'm saying a DevOps culture, uh, it's daunting. I mean, it's scary, right? I mean, it's, you're changing processes that have probably been in there since day one of the company, right? You're trying to maybe make, improve some processes, maybe take some changes to them. And you're also trying to, when you're really making these changes, it oftentimes is seen as grief, right? So the title is The Five Phases of DevOps is kind of a play on the five phases of grief. And I, <laughs> it's a little dark, but yeah. <laughs> um, well, the organization, and also it's important though that when you're doing these changes, you don't try and force a culture onto your company and your organization, right? You gotta find something that's natural and just works in a holistic manner for your, for your company and your users. So about that being said, Let's dive into phase one. <laughs> Denial. <laughs> this is fine. You know, there's a fire in the corner. It's okay, it's been there since day one. It's okay, it's all good. You know, let's just leave it. So in this phase, you'll kind of know if you're there or not by, you'll hear things like, everything's fine, despite everyone knowing that things are not, right? Or worse, people know there's an issue and they just don't want to change it. There's an issue and it's, it's how it's always been, you know? I'm afraid to change. I don't know what will happen if I don't do that process. You might see an attempt and establish an automation culture. And by an automation culture, I mean you start writing scripts around processes instead of asking the fundamental question, is that process really needed? And if there's a problem, hey, just hire 10 more engineers, toss it at them. We're great to go, right? Not necessarily. Sometimes this causes more problems than not, right? This, uh, it's, yeah. If you, you know you're also in this phase if this is how deployment looks. Uh, I know, because this was me a year ago. Uh, I had a much bigger desk, actually. So, you know, I had to include a, uh, a mandatory, what does DevOps mean, right? Uh, we all have our own definition of DevOps, and I think that's important. I think that diversity and having your own definition of DevOps within your organization and also for your team is very important. You know, every company kind of established, again, established in a natural way. I mean, your first instinct is that DevOps is automation. Simple, right? You write some scripts, you're good to go, you deploy into prod, you're, you're moving fast, right? Not quite, right? DevOps is asking you the hard questions. You know, it's, it's really trying to figure out what processes can be eliminated. Can you empower your developers? And ultimately, are you busting down silos to increase speed and agility? So, DevOps is not just a team, it's a complete culture shift. It's something that your whole entire organization needs to embrace. If just your DevOps team, or your automation team, or whatever you call it, is doing this, you're gonna have a really bad time. So again, like I said, you gotta bust down those silos. Empower your developers, that's something very important that we uh, at GoGo really are trying to push. And automated support, others do the same. So what do I mean by busting down silos? Oftentimes in a legacy organization, kind of like in a non-DevOps organization, you kind of see this, I pass the ball to QA, QA just chucks the ball, and then the ops guy just gets hit in the face because it doesn't work. <laughs> it's just a bad time, right? So really, what it should be is, go to this. Yes. Yes. It's just a clickable button. And, I mean, we laugh about the first picture, but it's kind of true um, because it, 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 it doesn't, it's not just funny, but it also causes some hostile behavior within the organization, right? So your developer's away, coding away, he's coding in Java, you know, he makes an awesome program, ships it off to QA. Pretty much they get moved on to the next project. Then your quality or uh, QA is now testing code. They might not have accurate requirements. They might not be able to have a direct channel to the QA organization. And then the QA says, hey, you know what? It passed my smoke test. I'm going to ship it off to the ops team. And then the ops team at like 1 in the morning or whatever, they have to deploy it. Of course it doesn't work. And then everything just has to be rolled back, nightmare. It's not a good scenario. I mean, in that culture, you also hear things like hostile comments, right? You hear things like, QA doesn't know how to test code, or the developers can't code their way out of a paper bag, or ops team, do they even know what Linux is? Do they even know how to deploy this code? And my question is why? Why would you kind of draw this hostile environment? Why not make a change to where you empower everyone to be on the same level platform and make deployments 
a click of a button. Yak shaving and eliminating it. Um, the, uh, organizers earlier this morning talked about it, but I always love to use this Malcolm in the Middle gift because it's great. It's like, to fix the light bulb, I gotta get a screwdriver to get the WD-40 to fix the drawer, then I gotta go fix the car. It's about eliminating uh, yaks in your organization. And you know what, yak, uh, having yaks in your organization is a normal thing of growth, right? You, you have a process and you just keep building on it, but it's important that you look back on them and you're saying, do these processes serve the same purpose they were initially implemented for? Have a well-defined mission statement and use this uh, statement to drive your choices and throw your tough decisions. So for us, it was easy. It was developers, 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 developers. You know, my friend Steve got it back right in 2000. So our, you know, it's, it's, everyone has to come up with their own answer, but for us, a great place to start was empower your developers. They're a great tool to help you drive automation throughout your entire culture. So we always ask ourselves whenever we had a tough question, a tough thing to implement, we're like, you know, will this make their life easier? Will it make them, will this empower them to drive change? Will this empower them to make their applications better? So I always like to tie it back to, you know, an example of how, you know, a real, real world example of how, how we kind of started. So Q3, we started this DevOps initiative. And people were like, huh? Oh my God. Like, what, what DevOps? What do we got to do here? So we started at the basics. Get your Git, get your Git instance, GitHub, GitLab, whatever you want. You know, build on that. Have your Jenkins server. You may already have a piece of these infrastructure as well. Leverage Packer, Ansible, and then start doing infrastructure imaging, immutable. And if you can consider an immutable infrastructure, please do so. And the great thing about immutable infrastructure is that you can, if you build it once, it's going to work. It's just you, you don't you don't build every time. You just ship the same the same piece of code, the same piece of hardware. Ship it through. I'm talking about a cloud-based microservices infrastructure, but the same can be applied for a data center as well. So things like um, auto-scaling Jenkins slaves, Git hooks to check sanity, uh, Jenkins job DSL. If you don't know what that is, look it up. It's awesome. It's like a lifesaver. So that was phase one. Phase two: fear and doubt. So this is what everyone thinks automation is. You know that, that steel beam's gonna come and just knock over all that iron, and just fire. And I, I knew it. It was not. It was not good from day one. So some common fears, right? Some common fears, this is what you're kind of hearing in this phase. You'll hear that, it's always been done that way. Why are, you, why are you being so difficult? Why are you trying to change that, right? And I think we all heard it before. What if you make things worse? What if you don't succeed? What if you cut over a process and you just completely fail, right? This is the way it's been done for the past five years. It's important that an organization takes these kind of risks and tries to make their process better, right? That's the whole point of DevOps, that's the whole point of technology, making things better. And really, the last one is the fear of the unknown. What does DevOps mean for me, right? Sometimes it can be seen as a hostile thing in an organization, like, am I gonna get replaced? My, my take on that is, if you're going in for DevOps to eliminate roles, you're doing it wrong, right? DevOps is about collaborating and driving unity on a shared platform so you can focus on the more important things. You know, deployments, they're menial. Fine, some of them may be more complex than others, but at the end of the day, it's a deployment. That's not the fundamental issue of your business. Your business is driving and improving your services for your customers. So that with DevOps. So within your team, as you're kind of growing and you're building your pipeline, in this phase, you're kind of saying, you're, you're making key decisions on tooling, right? You're setting up your continuous integration, right? You got your infrastructure as code, all that Amazon, uh, OpenStack, whatever have you. You're setting it all up, it's great. And during this phase, um, your DevOps team, you'll probably have questions like, hey, are we doing this right? It's like everything to the T. Is it perfect? I don't want to do this again. Is it going to be perfect? And are you 100% sure it's going to work? And you know what the short answer? No, it's not perfect. And I'm sorry, it never will be. And that's OK. Just make sure that you have the way and ability to improve on it in the future. Start small and set standards. So when you're getting started, you're going to be very tempted to just take on all the projects in possibly your legacy data center or in the cloud and revamp them, right? Uh, don't set yourself up for failure. Start small. Pick up that one project, succeed well on it, and start improving on it later on, right? So this is going to be things like um, take one project that may be your core business, or not maybe necessarily your core business, like an edge project, 
Figure out the kinks in your pipeline. This is going to be something that you've never had in your organization. It's brand new, right? And you're going to have problems, early on especially. So with that being said, pick a small homogenous base. So start off with your base operating system. You know, get a, get, pick one. Just pick one. If you're a Windows shop, you got Windows. If you're a Linux shop, pick a, you know, Fedora, Ubuntu, whatever. You, you know, what's your favorite? Start small. Don't compromise on the standards you set. Early on, take a good, hard look at your business. If 75% of your business is Java, does it really make sense to target 25% of your node developers, right? Sure, you want to support them, but at the early on, you want to make sure that you have a platform that meets the needs of your core business. And some examples like that we ran into are, early on, we wanted to support all the base operating systems. We wanted to have nightly builds for them. We wanted to have all these great implementations for them. But really, we had to take a step back, and you know, we asked our developers, so what do you want? You know, some of them, yeah, they had their preference because they wanted some benefits of the operating system, but those are really edge cases. Majority of the people said, does it have Java, and does it have Tomcat? All right, I'm good. I can deploy my war file on it. And again, I touched on it earlier, Java versus Java and JavaScript. Succeed well on one, and then go back and add your tooling later. Again, improve on the tooling in the future. Remember, these initial customers are going to be very skeptical of your process. They've never seen DevOps before. They may, this might be their first interaction in DevOps culture, especially uh, for us. Five years in green doing a same manual deployment, it's hard to break down those walls. It's a lot, you're also building a trust bond with these developers, right? It's important that they kind of feel empowered that, hey, things are going to work, things are going to be generally be better, and they're not going to suck like before. So the best way to determine issues in your tooling is honestly to deploy fast and deploy often, right? Making, making deploying the fastest part of your pipeline. So you can do that by making it a click of the button. And this is empowering your developers, your quality engineering organization, your operations, whatever person in the team to click that button, get reliable deployments, and more importantly, get reliable rollbacks. So remember that whatever tooling you do implement needs to be easier, needs to be faster, and needs to be more available and more reliable. Right, um, and uh, just really again consider an immutable architecture, infrastructure deployments, your rollbacks. Um, if you make your server no longer the sacred piece of infrastructure, you're reliably deploying that from dev to stage to prod. You're moving the same piece of code. So if it works once, it works everywhere. So um, some tooling that we used to kind of do this was uh, I think I mentioned it earlier. Um, if you haven't heard of it, there's a tool, Spinnaker. It's a great open source tool. It's uh, written by, uh, primarily by Netflix early on, and then Google kind of got involved, Microsoft, uh, um, I believe it was Pivotal, and uh, some other companies are getting really ingrained and, and giving back on it. And the best part, it's open source. So if you find an issue, submit it back. Um, with this, you've got to get a robust API to create a pipeline for your infrastructure. You get manual judgment for all the people that need to do SOX auditing and all that stuff, and PCI auditing. Uh, you got an index of your applications, which I think is invaluable. You know, what's actually deployed in my infrastructure? I, I challenge a lot of people to take a look and say, these apps are actually running, these are in dev, these are in stage. This gives you an accurate view to see where your stuff is at. And um, yeah, and custom pipelines for each application. Some other things to consider is, you know, leverage the tools that are great out there. There's a lot of DevOps people, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of a lot of these tools, Terraform, Vault, Console, Vagrant. We love them, it's great. It's because they just work, and the fact that they're open source, it just makes them that much better. So to kind of tie this all back, um, you see a part here where I say Asgard. Asgard was what came before Spinnaker. Um, don't use Asgard. Uh, <laughs> sample application, that's going to be your first, you know, you're bringing on your application, you're setting up your production, you're migrating your first app over, you're setting up your tooling, all that stuff. You have your, uh, your, your cloud trail, all that migration gold rush is what we call our mass uh, upcoming of applications. But really, by the end of December for us, we had half of a dozen apps. may not seem like a lot, but when we say deploying, we mean DNS records, security groups, IAM, tagging, Slack notifications, a bunch of other stuff. Phase three, compromise. Shut up and embrace DevOps. So in this phase, you're kind of asking, why does this specific process exist? Right? You're asking the question like, does the process still serve? the same purpose, maybe the reason it was implemented, the app is no longer in your infrastructure. Do you really need to keep doing that process? Is the process really required? Or is there something better? Like is there a better tool, or can we, do, you, do you really need it? Um, for us, 
was, does this process empower or impair my developers? If it impairs my developers, honestly, right now, it was, for us, it was, all right, this is already a negative on our part. But then also considering that, does this process also speed, increase my speed, or delay my speed uh, to, to time to market? And does this help break down uh, the silos that I talked about earlier? Does, or does this just keep perpetuating them? In this phase, you're also going to probably be evangelizing the concept of DevOps. So by evangelizing, I mean you're going to be explaining DevOps a lot. I mean, um, in DevOps conferences, we explain DevOps a lot. So you can only imagine to explain DevOps to non-technical people. What does DevOps mean? You know, a lot of people say buzzword, but not necessarily. It's, it's really about explaining the, 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 the key for success and things that like, you use to, you know, your, your early on um, drivers for success. So use metrics from your early applications you onboarded. So say like, hey, the, uh, this app used to take two weeks to deploy. Now with the pipeline we have built, it takes two, two hours, right? Uh, so again, use those metrics in your, ba uh, in your favor, explain the benefits of change, and improve support. Right? Um, DevOps doesn't necessarily rip, mean ripping out process, it means improving the support for them. Understanding technical debt. So in this phase, you probably already encountered technical debt as a team, you know, but what I'll say to kind of start off that phase is, you're not special. You're not a beautiful and unique snowflake. And that there's never a tomorrow, but there's always a today. And by that I mean that you know, in this phase, you have customers, uh, be it internal customers, that are relying on your tooling to do their day job, right? Early on, you probably could take the time to bring your Jenkins server down. Early on, you could shut down your GitLab server. No one made a cry. You take down your GitLab server, you just fundamentally stopped all your developers from deploying, or from committing their code, and then ultimately deploying their code, right? So you gotta make sure that you do this responsibly and know when you need to write tooling, when you need to implement tooling, when you need to do changes, and have a kind of shared agreement with everyone. Right? Don't try and make everything perfect. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Right? You see this circle here, we're trying to like align this puzzle to be this circle and a perfect circle, but it's never gonna just click. If there's already a tool on the market that does 80% of what you need, is it really worthwhile to write your own? You know? Because if that tool breaks, who's gonna fix it? It ain't gonna be me because I didn't write it. It's gonna be you or someone else on your team supporting that. It's gonna be a technical debt that's gonna keep eating away at you. And if you're having this many problems early on, it's only gonna get worse as you scale. And then ultimately, the last thing is, is don't try and force a tool um, to do something it wasn't built to do. Just, just don't do it. If it wasn't built to do it, just don't, please don't do it. <laughs> um, so we took an uh, initiative to say goodbye QA and hello quality engineering. So this means that QA is still writes their tests, they do all great, but QE is now empowered to write code and test as close as possible. So I'm gonna stop here and say developers in the crowd, this does not mean they're gonna write your unit tests, you're still on the hook for that. <laughs> and you know, so it, it's important to have testing integrated in your pipeline and have fast and reliable feedback. So when you deploy it to dev, if an issue occurs in their code, they should be able to know, line 76, I see the issue, patch it up, move on, deploy it to dev, looks great, deploy it to stage. It has to be fast, has to be reliable, and give that feedback to the developers. Again, empower developers. Metrics and monitoring are now a first class citizen. So this means that your metrics and monitoring team are now considered DevOps. What does that mean? So consider uh, the case that you're no longer using your logs in the sense of to kind of look at for errors, you're using actual application level metrics. So using things like Graphite to send out application level alerts, like if a service is sending a higher or lower latency. Um, using things like history, circuit breakers. If you're not concept, if familiar with the concept of circuit breakers, it's great, it's awesome. Have some default, uh, some default way to respond if a downstream service is having an issue. Um, considering these things early on. And remember that with the shift to this, developers are now the ones on call. So if there's an issue, you're the one getting called. But for that to happen, they need fast and reliable metrics. It's a shared responsibility. The OS needs to provide accurate metrics. What's the GVM? What's the heap size? You know, what's, what's, uh, how, uh, how much uh, memory is it using? How much uh, CPU is it using? On the flip side, developers are also responsible for application level metrics. Is this function working as expected? Is it too slow? Is it faster or slower than the last, the last deployment? And then service level metrics, right? Uh, can app B talk to A to C? 
So you overheard me say the name Hystrix, but this is kind of how the tool looks. It's a cool little tool. Um, so the little circle, the circles you see there, um, they're actually green, the slides kind of look a little funky. Um, the green, good, red, bad, um, it's a simple thing. The bigger circle, the more traffic. You see error rates there. Um, you see RPS, request per second. You see your, your circuit breaker status. It's a, it's a great way just to look and say, yep, my application is looking great. And strive for developers to be proud of these metrics, right? Have them, have them readily available so they can see them real time when they do a deployment. Is it working better? Is it working worse? Graphite and Grafana, um, great stuff. I mean, just, uh, this is a tool, uh, we use a, host, a company called Hosted Graphite, just kind of uh, to put our metrics in there. Getting things like latency, saying, hey, that deployment after we did it, it started getting a little slow. All right, maybe let's roll it back, let's take a peek, um, let's, look at, let's put, do some more stress testing back in our local stage environments. So how did this kind of look? Uh, again, we did a lot of uh, QE. Uh, we implemented Spinnaker, so we migrated from Asgard to Spinnaker. And then we had our security, developer metrics, and all this stuff, so. Phase four, no. acceptance. <laughs> yeah, I had to include a cat. I'm not a DevOps person if I don't have one. Um, so people like us. They really like us. So at this phase, you're gonna start hearing like educated conversations. If I ever take educated conversations, I mean like, how do I make my code better? How do I make this implementation work for just more people than myself? You know, do I have circuit breakers when things go wrong? And do I have enough metrics? You know, can the organization see the status of the application and get fast, reliable information as to how the application is performing? Um, at this phase, your early adapters are gonna start seeing a net positive. Um, they're, st they're gonna start seeing that, hey, things are working, things are better. And keep in mind that these are gonna be your champions moving forward, right? You can go to these guys uh, uh, and, and say, hey, how's the tooling? They're gonna be the ones to provide you the accurate information and you, know, you should listen to them um, when you're onboarding new applications. And at this phase, you're probably gonna have a lot of customers, a lot of internal, cust uh, when I say customers, I mean developers wanting to get on your tooling. But you know what? If you did it right, a lot of it's gonna be cookie cutter. Java Tomcat, move on. Java Tomcat, move on. Now, with that being said, there are gonna be edge cases and for that, it usually comes with uh, the fun acronyms of security, PCI, SOX. <laughs> A lot of this uh, fun stuff that we spend our day jobs kind of trying to meet compliance for. So how does this kind of look in practice? Um, again, uh, to tie it back, uh, I got a metric that we did 395 manual deployments. Uh, this is like someone logging on the server, a CP of the war file, restarting uh, JBoss at the time, Wildfly now. So when we started to look at it, within a single, almost, a, well not a quarter, but a quarter's worth of time, we saw that we had 18 apps deployed to prod in the new pipeline, right? Um, okay. But the most impressive stat was that in this almost a single quarter, uh, we almost did as many deployments as we did to prod in a whole year. And then keep in mind, this is our first iteration of it, so the hype is real, I guess. That's what you can kind of say, take away from that. So it, it, for us, it was, it, within a quarter, we were already seeing benefits of this stuff. Uh, some statistics. Artifacts, a lot of it, a lot of logs, a lot of GitLab projects. Don't want to bore you guys too much with details. Um, so again, we focused on SOX, cost management, multi-region, all that stuff. Um, Asgard deprecated, we want to get out of our infrastructure. So phase five, believe and repeat, <laughs> right? Good stuff. We're here. Things are stable. That app engineer no longer needs to use iTerm2 of 12 concurrent terminal sessions to restart all nodes at once. And that app engineer is not the one up here talking to you guys today. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I had to kind of include that because my SVP said, you better own it. <laughs> so, toss it out there. Uh, deployments are faster than ever. Things are working great. Developers are empowered to make their own changes and they have faster, reliable feedback. Keep in mind that this phase is when developers say, it's taking too long. It's taking 10 minutes. Hey, I saw you last year. It took two weeks to get your app to prod, all right? Take a chill pill, all right? So that's it, right? I'm at my desk right now. This is probably me wearing my shades, feet up, drinking them, uh, drinking my beverage of choice. Then your SVP, I don't think he's in the crowd. Okay, so as my SVP kind of uh, comes around and says, hey, do you want Docker? Do we have Docker support? Cost tooling? Do we have GCP? Do we have Google Cloud? Do we have Azure? Do we have open source? How about a hardware, uh, hardware malicious, software defined networks? Hey, what are you gonna do about that data center that we have? And to that I say, this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's
it's always a repeating cycle, right? And that's, what, that's the best part of DevOps, is that you always improve and get better. So um, you heard me mention, um, I promised some of the guys in, the, in my team that um, I would pitch this. Um, if you're already using Spinnaker, we're working on an open sourcing our tooling. Um, it's essentially a pipeline DSL language. So um, if you use Spinnaker, you know, to create your pipelines, you've got to kind of go in the UI. We're essentially trying to create a language that you can kind of define your infrastructure in a file, toss it in there into your, into your, within your Git repo, and uh, have it in there, and it'll, it'll, by default, Git will scan it, and then it'll create your pipeline for you. It's, uh, it's a pretty cool tool. Um, it's called Formast. Um, we're working to open source it now. It's still not there. It's just finishing the final touches. And uh, you're probably asking why in the Git repo. Um, we want everything to be one, uh, one source of truth, right? We want someone to say, this app and dev needs, uh, Amazon term, uh, T2 medium, uh, 4 gigs of RAM, let's say, or run. And in prod, it needs 16 gigs of RAM. But you know, find requirements. But you should be able to know those requirements early on and know what it takes to build that code, know what it takes to run that code, and more importantly, know what it takes to um, deploy that code throughout your infrastructure. So what I'll say is if it sounds interesting, um, come talk to us. I, I think some of us are in the crowd. We'd love to talk with you guys about it, even if you just use Spinnaker. I think it's always cool when I meet someone else that uses Spinnaker. It's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, with that being said, uh, thank you for coming to my talk. This is my first talk, so hopefully I didn't, I, I haven't passed out yet, so. Uh, <laughs>